All right, my name is Kelly Miller. I'm presenting my project, Platform for Peace, a case study of the gang violence in El Salvador and the crumbling truce. Um, as a quick geography brush up, El Salvador is the smallest and most densely populated country in Central America. Along with Guatemala and Honduras, it forms a region called the Northern Triangle, which has the unenviable position of being known as the world's most violent corner, and also known as a multifaceted transshipment corridor for transnational organized crime groups. There are two main gangs in El Salvador. They are called Mara Salvatrucha and Barrio 18. And between the two of them, they have 30,000 to 50,000 gang members, as well as assorted weaponry, including assault-style rifles and grenades. In March of 2012, the leaders of the two gangs sat down and officiated by a military chaplain um, and a former lawmaker made a pact to end the killings that were devastating their country. Uh, El Salvador has actually endured decades of violence. In the mid-1980s, uh, hundreds of thousands of Salvadorians um, fled the country from a civil war. Uh, Mara Salvatrucha and Barrio 18 were actually formed in Los Angeles as protection for the immigrants against the local Mexican and black gangs. They quickly gained notoriety for their subcultural moral code, um, which predominantly consisted of merciless revenge. So in the mid-1990s, to combat the growing levels of violence, uh, the US exported the problem back to El Salvador by deporting many of the local gangs. Um, because El Salvador was still recovering from the Civil War, didn't have established civil institutions, the gangs flourished. Um, then El Salvador developed its old policy for dealing with the gangs, which was known as Mano Dura, or Mano Dura, which translates to Iron Fist. Uh, it basically advocated the immediate imprisonment of gang members who could be arrested simply for having tattoos or for flashing gang symbols. Um, this quickly led to escalating levels of violence as well as uh, prison overpopulation. By 2011, the prisons in El Salvador were operating at 300% capacity. Um, and then we had the truce, which represented a real turnaround because it focused on prevention rather than punishment. Um, the truce was formed in March of 2012 and had very significant impact initially. Um, by October of 2012, the homicide rate had dropped 32%, kidnappings were down 50%, and extortion was down 10%. Uh, and by December, homicide rates had dropped from 15 a day to five, or th sorry, from 13 a day to five a day. Uh, the truce continued to develop and actually entered a second phase and gained international guarantors, but um, because its original architects were politically shoved aside, um, there was continued crime, and then there was a very close political campaign that. Uh, may, didn't agree with the truce. For the local uh, 2014 presidential elections, it rapidly disintegrated starting in 2013. As of early this April, the Ministry of Security released a statement saying that the truce was effectively over because at that point the homicides were back up to 8.9% or 8.9 a day. Um, so let's examine some of the consequences of the truce. Um, here we have the homicide rates from the Instituto Medicina Legal uh, from January of 2011 to March of 2014. You can see in March of 2012, when the truce was initially formed, there was a very steep drop in homicide rates. But I'd like to contextualize this for you. At that point, there were 32 homicides per 100,000 victims in El Salvador. That's still three times the rate that the World Health Organization classifies as epidemic violence. And as a further comparison, in Massachusetts in 2012, there are 2.6 homicides per 100,000 uh, citizens. Um, additionally, you can see in the far right that there's been a recent uptick in homicide rates. Uh, because of a very close political election for the new president, the candidates decided to distance themselves from the unpopular truce, um, and that led to gang retaliation. There was a 44% increase in homicide rates in the first three months of 2014, and additionally during Holy Week, which just concluded, there was an additional 39% increase in homicide rates. Um, this sh map shows El Salvador split up into its municipalities, and it examines or it compares the 14 months prior to the truce with the 14 months after the implementation of the truce. Um, you can see there are 58% of the municipalities in which the number of homicides dropped, 20% of the municipalities had no change, and 22% had the lethal violence increase. Um, from the geographical continuity of those 57 municipalities in which violence increased, um, you can observe that there are trafficking corridors going from Honduras to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, one of the key elements of the truce is that during this period, it did achieve a noticeable de decrease in homicide rates, and 24 out of the 25 municipalities, which 50% of the homicides had been concentrated. Um, you can also see that while the monthly average of the municipalities experiencing homicides fell by nearly half during this period, the dispersion rate 
remained fairly similar. In the 14 months prior to the truce, homicides were reported in 135 municipalities. The 14 months following the truce, they were reported in 129. Um, this is another map of El Salvador, but this time it compares the 14 months following the implementation of the truce, splitting it into the first seven months and the second seven months. This one has slightly different geographical trends. Um, there was a 30% increase in the municipalities which have lethal violence, um, or sorry, there were 30% of the municipalities had a lethal violence increase, um, and the dispersion is slightly larger, especially in the western part of El Salvador. Um, what these maps don't show is the level of disappearances in El Salvador, though. The level of disappearances increased um, throughout the course of the truce, causing many to believe that instead of just leaving the bodies in the open, the gangs were hiding the bodies, so to maintain a falsely low homicide rate. Um, this was confirmed with the discovery of at least eight current mass graves that are currently being examined. Um, another thing about disappearances was in 2012, um, one of the government ministers lauded the reduction in disappearances that year as the, one of the truce's uh, achievements. However, he made an erroneous comparison, comparing the cases reported in 2012 to all people missing, or sorry, the cases reported in 2011 to all people missing in 2012. This shows that one of the main weaknesses in El Salvador is their management of statistics, um, and it's something that's considered a real problem because it means their action plans are potentially based on faulty information. Additionally, it means that promises of improvement often fall flat because there's no way to show that there's improvement. Another type of crime that continues to prevail in El Salvador is extortion. Um, in 2013, in June of 2013, 70% of small and micro businesses in El Salvador uh, reported that they had been extorted within that year, which led to an average of two businesses per week closing. Um, while there had initially been talk of the government financing uh, rehabilitation programs, including new jobs for gang members who are trying to transition back into society uh, because of the very close political race, uh, it undermined the financial support and the money never materialized, causing gang leaders to continue to rely on extortion as a means for survival. Uh, my project sought to answer three core questions. Um, first, what led to the truce's de facto collapse? Second, what infrastructure did the government build to increase the chances of ex-gang members reintegrating into society, and in what ways was it effective? And third, what does the government's role, combined with the significant impact of the truce, mean for the legitimacy of gangs as political actors in El Salvador? All right, so <laughs> the sustainability aspect as of April, it's pretty much over, um, but there were a lot of factors contributing to that. Uh, what I thought was the most important one was the lack of political legitimacy and support that the truce received. There were three potential sources for that. The first and most important was the president, um, Funes. At this point, he's notorious for a simultaneous refusal to embrace the truce, the truce and to reject it. Um, his ambivalence has exasperated the talks negotiators and observers because without his firm support, obtaining assistance of any kind for the affected communities inhabited by gangs was nearly impossible. Um, further, his political reluctance dampened the participation by others who might have contributed to legitimacy and transparency. The next president doesn't seem like he's going to be any more supportive than Funes was because this spring, El Salvador experienced the very tight presidential election, which we already went over. So to distance himself, Sanchez Seren, who is the current FMLN candidate who will take the presidency in June, or be inaugurated in June, said during his campaign that he would not negotiate with any sort form of criminal actors, and he has yet to release an updated security plan. Another potential source of support could have been the United States. Fun fact, Salvadorians are opposed to pass uh, Cubans as the third largest Latino group in the United States. They currently have two million people in the US, which is a third of their population, so remittances are significant. Um, therefore, for the Salvadoran government to go against the United States would be politically disastrous. Uh, in 2012, the U.S. Treasury labeled Mara Salvatrucha as a transnational criminal organization and said that they were going to advocate the uh, removal of six kingpins from El Salvador, um, the extradition, sorry. Uh, so it shows a shift from the U.S. kind of not interfering to active interference. While it was unrealistic to ever, uh, uh, to ever uh, expect the U.S. to openly advocate for the truce and support negotiating with criminal actors, they could have used back channels to imply their support for this experiment to President Funes, which might have bolstered his decision and reduced the uncertainty that clouded his presidency. A third potential source of legitimacy could have been the church. Um, top church officials rejected 
um, the initial overtures by the government architects of the process, fearing that the church would be used as a rubber stamp of legitimacy. However, two years later, they are still acting like they were slighted and actively um, slamming the process. The church, and not just one bishop, is was very much needed to support this truce. The church, church offered infrastructure, working programs, access to communities, and without its the support of the entire church hierarchy, public support for the negotiated solution was impossible. Um, El Salvador did start to provide infrastructure for rehabilitation. The second phase of the truce involved the implementation of violence-free zones in which gang leaders agreed to reduce crime and violence in those areas and voluntarily give up their weapons in return for free movement throughout a municipality and more reinsertion programs for them and for the people in their gangs. Um, however, the financial support didn't ever actually appear in eight out of the 11 municipalities in which um, the program was tried out, never received that support. Uh, further, <laughs> sorry, if the infrastructure were to continue in the future, it would need a more holistic approach, which examined the and supported the gang member's relationship with his family, his colleagues, and um, other ex-gang members in the community. It would also probably need some sort of religious component. A lot of the peop the average age for someone to join a gang in El Salvador is 11 years old. So they're desensitized to violence and raised in without a real moral code or like one that we would consider normal. So a lot of times religion is very helpful for establishing that moral code. Um, third, they would probably uh, need some more very explicit ways of monitoring uh, people's compliance with the truce in order to show improvement to the rest of the populace and gain popular support. Uh, one of the big fears with the truce was that it would legitimize gangs as political actors in El Salvador. Um, in a country with such weak institutions and government, gang customs or mandates often replace the rule of law. Uh, here, swap, they swapped homicide rates for better prison conditions, and it's a very dangerous proposition. It's a de facto nod to the gangs that their violent ways had secured them enough political capital to negotiate with the highest levels of government. Um, however, it doesn't seem like this political legitimacy has uh, become real. The gangs remain very po unpopular. They have no formal political representation and have very little to develop a coherent political platform. Their strength continues to lie in their numbers um, and their uh, willingness to use force. Um, what remains important, I think, in the face of all this data is the continued public perception um, and the persistent perception of insecurity on the part of everyday Salvadorians. Uh, the survey taken by the Public Institute of Opinion in May of 2013 illustrated uh, this very well. When asked whether or not they believed that the truce had reduced crime rates, 45% uh, said not at all, 20% said a little bit, and only 10% replied a lot. Until there's popular public support, their truce cannot survive and hasn't because of that. Um, speaking from my personal experience as a resident of California, when Arnold Schwarzenegger ran for governor, one of his plat political platforms was like this, more police, more prisons, more cameras, and more protection, which reinforced Adam Blackwell's quote that whether you're in a third world country or a developed country, it's much easier to spell, sell Mano Dora. Um, for purposes of research and to a personal extent, uh, my personal sanity, I decided to stop updating my research for this project on April 15th. Um, however, as I'm sure you can tell from the presentation, it's an ongoing, highly vol volatile process. In just the last week, church leaders proposed reviving the truce in order to curb the resurgence of violent crime. Um, Richard Perdomo, who is the new Minister of Security, proposed a national pacification plan that seeks a process of dialogue involving representatives from economic, political, religious, and cultural sectors, as well as the leaders of the street kings of MS-13 and Barrio 18. Essentially, he wants to hit a rewind button and redo the truce, but with more infrastructure and more inclusive processes and stricter rules. Um, this could be a political stunt ahead of the new president's inauguration, but I'd like to cross my fingers and hope that it's for real. Um, I anticipate this pace of change continuing or even accelerating in the near future, and I know I will continue to watch it um, to see what shakes out, and it should be very interesting. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who helped me with this process and all of you for listening.